from downtown Milwaukee, welcome to Money Talk with Bob Landis. Each week, professional advisors from Landis and Company Investments discuss the latest financial developments, offering timely insight and long-term perspective. This is Money Talk for October 6, 2023. The Packers are in Vegas getting ready for Monday Night Football with the Raiders. Your Milwaukee Brewers are in the wait till next year mode, and today is the National Badger Day. You can celebrate with local Wisconsin beer, just like every other day. <laughs> Tourists are flocking to New York City, not for the restaurants or Broadway, but to go on rat tours. People are flocking to the Big Apple to see rats the size of Volkswagens. <laughs> the iconic rats are now the mascots of the, metrop- of the metropolis. It's all about marketing, but rats are still rats. We're pretty familiar with the term fake news. Well, the British tabloid TV show has taken it to a new level. They claim King Charles piloted a UFO in Canada. You think with those ears, they would slow him down. <laughs> in France, a fish got lodged in a snake's throat, and the lesson learned is you should never eat anything bigger than your head. While he was feeding ducks, a 74-year-old Florida man was attacked by a rabid otter. He was bitten a dozen times on both arms. And as always, no good deed goes unpunished. And finally, if you were with us last week, you might remember the story of a woman dropping her Apple Watch in an outhouse and getting stuck while trying to retrieve it. (laughs) This week, a man lifted a toilet seat to find not the woman's watch, but a two-foot-long iguana hiding in the bowl. That just might speed up the process of why he's in the bathroom in the first place. (laughs) On the podcast today, we have Dave Sandstrom, Adam Bailey, Joel Driesinger wrapping up the week. Here's Kyle Tedding. Well, thanks, Max. A bit of a mixed week for the markets. The NASDAQ up 1.6%, closing at 13,431. The S&P up a half a percent, closing at 4,309. Up 20 points for the week, but the Dow down three tenths of a percent, down 100 points for the week, despite a 288 point positive day on Friday for the year. The Dow up a, a pretty uh, impressive two and a half percent, given some of the give back in recent weeks. Even more impressive, the S&P up 13.6 percent, including dividends, and the Nasdaq a pretty stellar 29.1. You know, another notable news: the uh, yield on the 10-year U.S. Treasury moved. Uh, from 4.57% to 4.78% this week. Uh, You know, perhaps, Dave, a sign that as uh, investors look ahead, they're seeing higher rates for longer and beginning to finally price that in. Yeah, it's interesting, Kyle, because we've we've talked about this. You know, when the yield curve inverted uh, uh, at the end of last year and earlier this year, you you always have to ask yourself which which end is going to end up you know, capitulating and and uh, who's going to give in first. And the Fed has maintained that they are going to be there for a while. And, and we're finally starting to see some of that, um, you know, be indicated in in the longer, uh, longer dated treasuries. So we're kind of coming up to that, you know, bumping up against that five number, which, you know, I think historically is a little bit high. But I think it's important to remember we are coming off of unprecedented lows, so I, I do get a lot of clients talking to me about the fact that, you know, we're headed to these, you know, th- these are crazy times or we're headed to unprecedented times. And that's not really true. I, I would say we're probably headed back more towards normal. I mean, over the course of history, it would be far more frequent to see a 10-year note with a four at the beginning than it would to see it with a one, uh, which is where we are coming from. So it, it might be a little painful in the process of getting to this normalization, but I think for long-term investors – this is actually going to be a positive. Yeah, and you start to see um, the yield curve starting to normalize. It's still um, inverted, but as longer rates have come up, uh, less of an inversion, maybe at some point we get back to the normal yield curve, but back to the normal of getting paid for, for bond money and for cash. And you look back over the last 14 years where bonds paid you very little and cash paid you nothing. Now you're finally getting paid to hold some cash and hold some bonds. And that is historically more normal than what we've seen. And Adam, parts of the yield curve have normalized when you look at the 10-year versus the five-year, for example, as opposed to the 10-year versus the overnight. I think it's a strong reminder that there's really only one thing that matters for the overnight rate and for really short-term bonds, and that is what's the Fed saying, what's the Fed doing? 
when you look at the market more broadly for bonds, it's really our expectations for the future that drive the bus on rates in the two-year, five-year, 10-year window. And so, um, you know, I think seeing some normalization is a healthy place to be. It points to an economy that's strong enough to support that higher for longer that the Fed's been talking about. And so uh, I'm encouraged by the fact that it isn't the Fed having to backtrack. It's the market seeing that, yeah, maybe these higher rates aren't going to to uh, you know, sink the ship the way that so many thought. You know, I think as we look at those higher rates, it begins to change the math for investors on how they should consider allocating their portfolio, Dave, and kind of our email back and forth. You mentioned some comments on the 6040 portfolio. This thought last year that the 6040 portfolio might be dead, and we kind of said, hey, wait, hold on a minute, maybe not. Um, there may be some new thinking on that. Yeah, I think they were trying to indicate to us that you know bonds were out of the picture uh, because of the down year that they had, and that you might have to go to a much more of a an aggressive stock portfolio. And now uh, you could almost make the case for if the sixty forty portfolio is dead, it's because we're headed to maybe more of a fifty fifty mix uh, for some in- investors, and certainly an opportunity now going forward in the in the coming years to maybe derive a little bit more of that return from a balanced portfolio from the bond side as opposed to equities. Now, obviously, with with reduced rates over the last 10 years, it had pushed a lot of people into markets. And, you know, the S&P certainly was returning far more than its average over that time frame. And likely that's going to come down now in the, in the coming years because of the elevated rates. But it isn't a time to panic because if you are balanced, that portfolio now on the bond side that was only offering you that one and a half to two percent over the last ten years is going to be coming up to a much higher yield, you know, potentially in that five percent range. So, you know, maybe a, a little more from your bond portfolio, a little less from the stock portfolio, you get to the same place, but maybe with a little less volatility. You know, you mentioned uh, valuations, not just on the bond side or the stock side, but uh, on the growth side, one of the things that we have talked about over the past several years is in the period where interest rates were very low, it could sustain much higher multiples specifically for growth stocks. And now that interest rates are higher, ah, that math doesn't make as much sense where maybe the valuations shouldn't be as high when interest rates are like that. Uh, so you st- start to see some of the, the froth and the valuations come out of the growth side of the market as interest rates have moved higher. Yeah, as it's supposed to. And, you know, Adam, I think the the interesting part there is that the reason you buy growth is for the expectation that down the road it's worth a lot more than what it's worth today. Higher interest rates mean you have to discount that future growth a lot more, meaning you're willing to pay less today. But, you know, no shortage of stories that are talking about here's why you still should be interested, even if not, maybe not quite at the prices you were interested before. You know, we've talked at length on this podcast about artificial intelligence, but the other one uh, that, that started to come out a little bit this week was uh, on some of these weight loss drugs that are out there, some of the drug developments uh, that are are likely to be blockbuster deals for some of these pharmaceutical companies. But just like the conversation about artificial intelligence having some unintended consequences, maybe in destroying some jobs, in changing the way a lot of folks do business, we're seeing some changes uh, and maybe some consumer preferences become because of some of these drugs. Yeah, you know, Kyle, the uh, the article that you sent around that we were um, you know talking about before the show started, where you know Walmart announced that they're seeing some of their customers who had purchased the weight loss drug um, start to change their consumer behavior, and they were purchasing less food and, and drinks, specifically though, like the sugary foods and drinks and changing consumer behavior. And uh, what I found interesting is that it is starting to impact the way we behave and the way we buy. But more interestingly was um, I didn't know that Walmart was able to track, you know, what consumers are buying for medication and what they buy the rest of the uh, at the store. So I don't know how I feel about that one, but that was interesting. You no, know, I think an important reminder that these uh, these retailers know just about everything about us. Uh, there's a maybe apocryphal story out there of uh, a a partner that found out that uh, their their spouse was pregnant long before the spouse even knew they were pregnant uh, because Target had sent some uh, some baby information to the house. Uh, based just on what the, the the partner had been shopping for, and so I think as we uh, as we enter this environment in which that data is readily available, 
Um, you know, these are the kinds of stories that are going to come out, and really they're stories about change, right? They're stories about how the world is continuing to shift, how our expectations for where we should be looking have to shift as well. And so I think it's an in- interesting juxtaposition to the, hey, maybe I'm a li- little less willing to pay up for growth because interest rates are higher, but also, hey, some of that stuff that's growth-oriented is going to change uh, not just uh, you know their market, but a lot of markets around them, and we need to be able to adjust accordingly as investors. You know, Joel, a lot of changes in the economic landscape this week from an ADP jobs report on Wednesday that said, hey, maybe things aren't great, to a jobs report here on Friday that said, hey, maybe we were wrong and things really are great. Um, what uh, what are you looking at this week? What should uh, investors be thinking about some of the changing economic numbers? Yeah, for what it's worth, I don't usually look at the ADP report much because I'm not sure I understand why that's such a big deal when it comes out one day and a couple of days later we get the official bigger numbers from from the federal government. Um, and and there seems to be a lot more um, of the trends that we see from from the Labor Department stuff. And and today's report was very strong. It um, it beat a lot of expectations for whatever expectations are worth. And that's, that's um, an understatement. It was double what well, the expectations uh, were. Yeah, I'm 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 seeing headlines saying that it's stunning and it's you know show stopping and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, but a reminder that it's just one month of data, and a lot of times they revise the, the data. One of the, one of the stunning things about it was that it's the first month in a while in which they revised the previous month's um, job numbers upward. Um, they'd been revising them downward as a trend, and, and this time they revised them upward. It was a very strong report in terms of the job numbers. Um, so we've had 33 months in a row where we've had increased employment in the country. Um, it was above the 12-month average at a point when, again, you know, the the Federal uh, Reserve is trying to slow down the economy by raising interest rates, and you're not seeing it slow down that much in jobs. And, you know, I think that's the key to all of this and the very reason why the 10-year Treasury has been allowed to move a little bit higher without – uh, you know, too much broader concern. Yeah, good news has been bad news for the markets, uh, you know, more more often than not the last couple of months. But, you know, ultimately good news becomes good news. And if more people are working, if uh, payrolls are growing, it should be a sign that the economy is strong enough to move forward. I, I did see some indications in that report, though, that somewhat temper the good news. Um, so uh, temporary employment is usually a harbinger of, of the trends in hiring because you you know a lot of companies will will hire or fire their temporary workers before they do it with with their full-time staff. So um, the, that number for temporary employment has been down nine months in a row. So if that's still a harbinger, um, you know that suggests something and that's something that would, please the Fed because they're, that's slowing down the economy. Also, the wages. Um, and, and I know Adam likes this number, but you know, wages since May have been outpacing um, uh, CPI inflation, and that's good. Uh, and, and it's the first time that that's happened. Uh, there were 24 months in a row where inflation was going faster than, than wages, but, but now it's, it's back where wages are higher. But um, the wages, uh, the, the year-to-year increase in wages um, is slowing down. So for three months in a row, that's, that number has been decelerating. And if you look at the last three months, the, the rate of uh, wage increases is about what it should be for a 2% level of inflation, which is what the Fed is shooting for. You know what I found interesting today is that maybe we have broken from the dynamic of Good news is bad news, bad news is good news, where today we had a very big jobs number that came out, and it was maybe so big or too strong that it became clear the Fed cannot back off on raising rates, and we're probably going to get an interest rate increase uh, this November, perhaps. Um, And usually that would take the market lower, but it didn't today. And maybe we broke from the dynamic and realizing, okay, the economic momentum is still pretty strong. Jobs are still pretty good. Wages are rising faster than inflation. The economy still has a lot of momentum and consumers remain healthy. And to steal a phrase from Art Rothschild, my colleague, the texture of today's uh, market was pretty good where the moment the jobs number was released, 
initially the market sold off pretty aggressively this morning, and then it rallied pretty much the rest of the day into the close. And you know, to steal a phrase from Art, the texture of the market was pretty good this afternoon. Yeah, I think what we have to keep a, a you know the big picture on is the fact that unemployment below four now for how many months, Joel? You had the no 19, nineteen nineteen months, months in a row. row, and we're still piling on jobs at a at a pretty brisk pace here. So we have a long way to go before we can reverse that unemployment number. Right. I mean, not only do we need to get to not negative job creation, then we got to push that 3.6, 3.7 number up into the, you know, beyond the five number before right. I think you start to really look at an economy that's on the, you know, starting to struggle. Right. I mean, so we got to, there's a lot of room uh, in that employment picture and in the consumer's safety net Net, in my opinion. Right. And, and I think the concern is that the, the Fed's going to keep raising rates to, to try to, you know, slow down, especially those job numbers. And the fear is that they'll do that. I mean, historically, if they've done that too far, we've gone into a recession. And so there's this big bugaboo about going into recession. We talk a lot about pulling the punch bowl away from the party when, with respect to the Fed. And I think we, we long ago took the punch bowl away of accommodative interest rates. And here we are, and the party's still going. Um, and so, you know, to to your point, Joel, I think we got to continue to be concerned that these uh, partiers start to get a little bit upset about where the economy's headed, that we start to see some softening. But, you know, for now, things things look okay. And yet, you know, we got an ISM manufacturing number that was maybe a little softer than um, what we uh, might have hoped. It's up a little bit from where it had been, right? But uh but soft nonetheless. Right, yeah. Another, you know, some more examples of bad news may be good news if, if you're, you know, on the side of the, the economy slowing. The, the, that ISM manufacturing index um, has been down for, it's, for 11 months in a row, it's been showing that um, the, the manufacturing sector has been contracting. But it's, uh, it, it still had its highest level in those 11 months, so that's good. Um, uh, and w- another, a couple of other manufacturing things was that um, we had numbers on factory orders, and if you take out um, transportation equipment, uh, which is a big um, volatile aspect of that, um, and it kind of evens out the rest of the report, if you take that out, then manufacturing orders have been um, actually in a negative um, since the, a year ago. So uh, that's showing some softness in manufacturing that may, again, play into what the Fed wants as far as slowing down the economy. And softness that we've known has been out there, depending on uh, what you're looking at, whether it's the earnings numbers that we've seen now, some some consecutive quarters of earnings decline uh, rather than earnings glo- growth, finally getting back to growth here, hopefully in the third and fourth quarter as we start to get earnings numbers reported. Uh, the benefit of that is now that we're into uh, October, we can start to look another quarter into the future for our next 12-month earnings. Uh, the earnings uh, forecast number took a big jump as a result, which helps kind of our forward earnings multiple. Uh, we'd been talking about a forward earnings number on the S&P that was something like 232 or $233 a share. Uh, and all of a sudden, in the span of basically a flip of the calendar, uh, you add seven or eight dollars to the forward earnings number, and things look just that much better. We're going to do it again when we transition from the end of the year into next year, and the growth really starts to pile on, and so valuations become, I think, less of an issue. You know, just to add some meat on the bone for that one, uh, on a percentage basis, earnings growth for the fourth quarter of this year could be somewhere between eight to ten percent, and that's a big number. And we're now at the point where we're looking ahead to next year. And earnings growth for next year could be somewhere between 10 and 12% from what is a pretty decent year this year. Yeah, and I think the key there is that that's what's going to support stock prices where they are. Um, If we hit those numbers, it allows for a little bit of a melt higher. Uh, And, you know, ultimately, I think uh, a, a nice positive way to end the conversation this week, the expectation that... Um, you know, we don't need 15 or 20 percent earnings growth to come back to where we're supposed to be. We just need pretty, pretty average or, or maybe even slightly below average earnings growth from what we've seen uh, over maybe the past decade or so. And I think that's a, a pretty happy place to be in knowing since stocks have sold off the past couple of months, since earnings have started to come back, that 
um, all of a sudden we don't look quite as expensive as we did. And that makes me a little more interested in not just Dave, the bond side, as you mentioned earlier, and maybe that 50-50 portfolio is a little more opportunistic, but we're going to get some participation going forward from stocks and bonds both. You know, Kyle, it's also, uh, I think, meaningful to, to look at the how narrow the breadth has been in the in the gains this year, as you know, as you can tell here from these numbers, where the Nasdaq being up almost thirty percent on the year and S and P half of that. Um, you have to hope for that better participation, and and as we look to Adam to your comment about earnings across the board, maybe that opens the door for some of these other companies that have not participated this year to finally get into that into that game and get into more of that upside. Uh, that's coming um, for those forward numbers. So it might be different areas of the market that uh, next year that really participate. So there could be some deals out there to be had if you if you look around. Yeah, and broad market participation is what you really want. We haven't had that yet, but that could be coming. It'll just take a few of these companies recognizing what consumers' preferences have changed to with respect to some of these new uh, drugs that are out there and what that might mean. And perhaps, you know, maybe some of that changing dynamic is one more reason why there's a little better growth expectation than even maybe what's being baked in right now. With that, we enjoy doing the program for you. We'll talk to you again next week. Thank you for listening to Money Talk with Bob Landis. If you have a financial question you want answered on next week's show, email it to moneytalk at landis.com. To keep informed throughout the week, visit our Money Talk page at landis.com. <laughs>